Uh, good morning and welcome to the 19th meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. <coughs> a couple of uh, matters. First of all, Willie Coffey um, is not attending today and in his place we have Gordon MacDonald um, as a substitute. Gordon, do you want to make any declaration? Uh, I have no declarable interest, uh, convener. And can I also apologise to members of the committee and the minister because I have to attend the audit advisory board at 11 o'clock and I'll need to leave early. Okay. Uh, this is Gordon's first attendance to meeting, and that was by the necessity for declaration. Uh, and while we're on at the beginning of the meeting, can I also say uh, to Liam Kerr, who this is his last Finance and Constitution Committee meeting, Liam, we've very much valued your contribution uh, in the time you've been on, on the committee, and uh, we look up obviously forward to. <laughs> Alexander, coming in your, your place after the summer, but thank you very much for all your contributions over the, the past months. Very thank grateful. you, um, The first item on our agenda is to decide whether to take item three in private. Are members agreed? Agreed. We are agreed. The second item on our agenda is to take evidence in relation to Brexit from the Minister for UK Negotiations in Scotland's place in Europe, Michael Russell. Uh, the Minister is joined by Scottish Government officials, Gerard Byrne from the Constitutional Policy Unit and Ellen Lever from the European Strategy Manager. Uh, Minister, um, do you want to make an opening statement? I don't. I think there will be plenty of questions, so that would be a bit um, superfluous. OK. And, well, let's get straight down to the questions. In the run-up to the Article 50 um, letter, uh, I understand that both the Scottish Government and the Welsh Government were unhappy with the way that they were treated. In the Brexit process, do you believe that the UK Government has so far conformed to its constitutional obligations with respect to the devolved administrations? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, it's a point I made in a, a lecture in Cork in April, and I've continued to make it, and I think the situation is worsening. If I may uh, explain what I mean by that, the, the actual terms of Article 50 require a uh, due constitutional process from the country that is withdrawing to be observed. Uh, that's difficult to define within the context of the UK because there is no written constitution, but there would be an expectation uh, of uh, following what were, was the current constitutional practice. There does exist a joint ministerial structure, and as a result of Brexit, the new part of that structure was put in place, the JMCEN, with a written terms of reference which are available for all to see. Uh, two parts of it are particularly important. The first part was seeking to agree a common uh, UK approach to Article 50. Now, it could be that that process could not produce such a, 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 an approach. That's perfectly feasible. But it was a, 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 the obligation of the UK government to try and do that. At no time did the JMCEN see a draft of an Article 50 letter. At no time was a discussion held about what should be in that Article 50 letter. Uh, and indeed, the Article 50 letter, when it was published, the, the first time I saw it was half an hour after it was published, when the Prime Minister was on her feet. So, but that is past. And you know, one of the purposes I hope today is to see what lies ahead, because we are in a very serious and difficult set of circumstances. And the second part of the remit of the JMCEN uh, is to attempt to have oversight um, of the, insofar as it is possible, and there's a caveat, and I accept that, uh, insofar as possible, of the negotiations with regard to the devolved competencies. Now, the JMCEN was meant to meet monthly. It last met in February. <laughs> there is no plan uh, that we know of for a future meeting. No, none of my officials have uh, been approached about a meeting, and we have urged a meeting. Uh, Mark Drakeford, my Welsh counterpart, and I have worked closely on this. We've made positive suggestions to the UK government about uh, reforming uh, the JMC, uh, focusing it more closely. We're very willing to participate in that way, but we don't know if it's going to happen. So going forward, it, it also there is the potential also that there will not be this discussion. Uh, and if you also look at what uh, an expectation would be at this moment in the negotiations, um, I was in Brussels last week. I, I spoke to a wide range of people, some of whom had been briefed by uh, Barnier uh, immediately after the talks. Um, I've had no briefing from the UK government about what took place in those talks. I had a, an informal discussion with Tim Barrow last Tuesday night, which touched on one or two issues, particularly the budget issue. But I, I've, David Davis has not rung me to say this is what took place. We were meant to have a conversation on Friday, which didn't happen because he was unwell. I'm sorry about this. I spoke to Robin Walker, the Under Secretary, who a uh, very pleasant conversation. But he told me I would receive a phone call and a briefing. I've had nothing. Neither has the Welsh Minister. 
So I really think if we're serious about this, if we're serious about the process of the JMCEN, if we're serious about engagement, then we need to get on with it. And it has to observe constitutional due process. And it isn't. Okay. Uh, Patrick. Thank you, convener. Good morning. I just wanted to explore for a moment the implications of yesterday's statement. Uh, obviously, there are aspects of that, very substantial aspects, which, were, which are out with the, uh, the, the direct discussion about Brexit, which are your remit and the purpose of, of today's meeting. But there is there's clearly a, a sense of a, a change of approach to Brexit specifically in some parts of that, that statement. Can you say what that change is? Well, I think everybody would accept, and I won't go into the details of it, and I'm happy to do so if people want me to, but I suspect that would probably just lead to a political ding-dong. Um, I think everybody would accept that the election on June the 8th produced some changes, and uh, particularly it produced a, a set of circumstances in which the UK government um, does not command, in my view, a majority for the type of hard Brexit that appeared to be uh, inevitable uh, before the 8th of June. It would be an opportunity for a new approach to this very difficult subject. And indeed, you know, it's not just me that's saying it. I, I would call the Archbishop of Canterbury in, in evidence, who at the weekend said there needs to be a, a cross-party, uh, much more inclusive view of this. So I was speaking yesterday uh, in place of the First Minister at the uh, annual meeting of the Association of British Insurers, the, their Brexit meeting. Uh, and again, their their president was calling for exactly that. And wherever I go, I hear people talking about the need for uh, change. So I think the First Minister reflected the seriousness of purpose of the Scottish Government of saying we want to engage in discussions about Brexit because it's very, very problematic now. The consequences of Brexit are so great. So uh, that's a space that has opened up to allow that to happen again, and we should allow that to happen. I'm addressing this, uh, uh, Mr Harvey, in the context of Brexit, that that's the changes that I think have taken place. And the opportunity now exists uh, to re-engage in a serious and purposeful manner to try and get some progress on this very difficult issue. One of the feelings I've had most frequently over recent months, and I suspect many people in the 48% throughout the UK who voted Remain and the 62% throughout Scotland who voted Remain, and I suspect some who voted Leave uh, and have realised they couldn't believe what was printed on sides of buses during that campaign. One of the feelings I've had most frequently is in hearing politicians who know this is wrong going along with it uh, and simply accepting that something that they know will cause huge social and economic damage uh, to the country, to Scotland and to the UK, uh, simply accepting uh, and going along with it. And for many of them, uh, I had to accept that they were representing people who voted leave. The Scottish Government, I thought, was taking a different position so far, recognising that it represents and that we all represent people who by majority, by clear majority, voted remain. Uh, and I thought that the Scottish Government's view was to say that Scotland has not consented to this. Is it still your view that Scotland has not consented to this? And are you willing to fight for membership of the European Union, not just the single market? It is still my view that Scotland hasn't consented to this. And, and my position, the position of the Scottish Government, has not changed in terms of full membership of the EU. However, what the Scottish Government did in this paper was endeavour to seek a compromise uh, in difficult times. And I suppose what we're continuing to say is if we require to seek that compromise, if that compromise is the best we can make of a bad job at the moment, and I still wish us to be a full member of the EU, I still, it is quite obvious that the situation in the EU is a changed one over the last 12 months. The EU is stronger, it's making greater progress, it, it, it is in actual fact in much better health uh, than people thought it was, whereas the UK appears to be much worse health than people thought it could be. In all those circumstances, could we find a way forward, a, perhaps a transitionary way forward? Now, I think the transitionary way forward is membership of the single market at this stage. That is, of course, traditionally a way into the EU, you know, and it might well work in that way for, for Scotland. It could be seen as a way out for the rest of the EU. But I am not in doubt that if I could find a way for Scotland to stay in the EU, I would find that way, and I continue to look for that way, but I'm also trying to make sense of what is the most astonishingly complicated and difficult political situation that any of us will have faced. And we have to be realistic about that too. It is astonishingly difficult. 
You've, you've indicated the, uh, the comments from the First Minister yesterday saying that we will uh, redouble our efforts and put our shoulder to the wheel in seeking to influence the Brexit talks in a way that protects Scotland's interests. Uh, she specifically cited that paper and then was clear that that meant staying in the single market. And uh, later she called on uh, other political parties uh, to, to back the Scottish Government's uh, demand to be at the table and to be able to influence the UK's negotiating strategy and for Scotland and the UK to stay in the European single market. Do you detect, and bearing in mind your comments uh, to, to the convener uh, about the lack of any sign of willingness to uh, treat the negotiation seriously with the devolved administration so far, do you detect any sign, either from the current Prime Minister or from her potential successors, that there is the hint of openness to staying inside the single market? Uh, I haven't heard any such hint. It's a very good question. Uh, the answer is how you would interpret what you see. It's like watching the Kremlin wall, really. Um, I, I, there is no statement that they have made that says that they are going to stay or are considering staying in the single market. But you look at, for example, the front of the Times today, which uh, seems to be a well-informed story about major difficulties between the key players within this. You're looking at a very unstable political situation, in which I think we do not know what the end game will be from it. I think it is therefore important to see if there is common ground amongst the majority of people who are engaged in this discussion and debate about the way forward. And I think the common ground that I, I detect and others detect is a willingness amongst those people to reconsider the single market issue, many of whom have never come off that issue. Whether or not the UK government will in the end find itself in that position is a moot point. I'll tell you one way in which that may happen. This question of transition is becoming quite crucial in, in discussion, and transition is an issue you know, which started off with, with the UK government saying no transition. Uh, I, I remember hearing a senior member of the UK government saying that transition would only encourage civil servants to think that we weren't leaving, so transition was f forbidden. We are now in a situation where people are quite openly talking about transition over a two to five year period, two to five year period. Now, transition isn't a third state. Transition is a continuation of what exists until it stops existing. I think that's also clear from everything you hear from, from, from Brussels. So maybe transition is membership of the single market through the EFTA EEA route, uh, whilst you know, other things change. That's an opportunity. Uh, and I, I can't be more firm than that, but I do think there is an opportunity and a continuing opportunity to try and get this into a better position. Um, you know, I, I noted that the leader of the Conservative Party in Scotland was talking about Brexit in different terms after the 8th of June, and she was talking about Brexit before the 8th of June. I'm not criticising her for that. I think that's a positive thing. So maybe we could find a way to allow this to happen. And Charles Grant of, of the Centre of European Research, I, I noticed, published something yesterday, and I saw him on, on Tuesday in London. He published something yesterday that talked about the way in which the, you might see a gradual shift taking place because politically it was very difficult for the Prime Minister to move in a precipitate way on this matter. So I think we have to be open to it, I think we have to discuss, we have to put principles up on the table, but I think we also have to find the structure to do so, and I go back to my response to Convener, the structure has to be at present through the JMCEN, because there isn't another structure. Can Adam, because he was interested in the transitional arrangements, and obviously that's become a feature of this discussion. So, Adam. Uh, thank you, Convener. Can I, can I ask, to start with, Minister, do you, does the Scottish Government now accept that the whole of the United Kingdom is leaving the European Union? Uh, it, it, that is the... I, I don't want to be awkward upon this, Mr Tompkins, because I'm, I'm not trying to avoid that issue. But I think that the certainty of that that existed before the 8th of June it no longer exists in quite the same way. The trajectory would still appear to be in that direction, but this is the most unpredictable set of circumstances that I have ever seen in politics, and I think any of us will ever have seen in politics. So that is still the trajectory. I'm working on the, the assumption that those negotiations have started will continue and, hope, and will, may come to a conclusion. But I think uh, it's like having lots of parallel universes. I think there are lots of other possibilities still some of which are very limited likelihood, some of which are much greater likelihood. So I can't be absolutely certain that that's the case, but I'm working on the basis that that present trajectory is where it's going. So I, I'll come to the single market um, in a minute, but I'm just talking about membership of the European Union. 
So the, the Scottish Government still has some reluctance, it seems from your answer, Minister, to accept that the whole of the United Kingdom is leaving its current status as a member state of the European well, Union. Well, it, it still seems to the Scottish Government, and it seems to many other place, people, and even more so after 12 months, that this is an exercise which is um, extremely difficult, incredibly expensive, and will not produce anything like the boosted advantages which were claimed for it during the campaign. I'm, I'm and just, in I'm fact, just, just can I just finish that answer? And it does seem that over the last 12 months, that argument has gained a great deal of currency. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. Um, uh, yesterday, the First Minister said uh, that she wanted her government uh, to play a role in the negotiations. I'm just trying to understand you know, what the First Minister and her government thinks these negotiations are designed to achieve. The, the UK government has made it perfectly clear that it wants these negotiations to achieve um, the United Kingdom leaving the European Union. Um, unless the First Minister and her government are able to accept that and to voice that in forums such as this, it seems to me difficult to understand how the Scottish Government can play a meaningful role in those negotiations. So let me ask a question again. No, no, Do you I, accept I, that the I, United Kingdom is leaving the European well, Union? Well, I'm trying to be helpful, Mr Tompkins, too, because I think it, the reality is the trajectory is in that direction. But you don't have to be a cheerleader for Brexit, uh, to say we need to be part of these negotiations to avoid the damage, well, for two reasons, to avoid the damage that we think that process will cause, because we do not believe it is a good idea, but it appears to be an idea that presently will take place. But I say presently because, you know, you must, everybody must accept this changes almost daily in terms of its dynamic. But in the present circumstances, our job, which we are very willing to undertake, is to be involved in that process, not least because those negotiations involve devolved competencies. So if we were to step back from those negotiations and to take a purist view on this, uh, then we would not be able to do our day job of defending Scottish interests, which is what we will do. So it is by no means inconsistent, indeed it's probably helpful for us to be a skeptical but helpful voice in trying to find a way through this. And that's what we're providing. But to say that you have to that you pass a loyalty test before you can take part in the negotiations isn't, in my view, helpful. Minister, don't, please don't put words in my mouth. I didn't talk about loyalty. If I wanted to talk about loyalty, I, I could very easily talk about that. That's not what I'm talking about at all. What I'm, I, we all accept that there is a degree of fluidity um, around um, the nature of the deal that the United Kingdom has just started to negotiate with the EU 27th. We all accept that. But I'm asking a more fundamental question. Um, uh, it seems to me that nobody um, on either side of those negotiations accepts that there is any doubt about what those negotiations are designed to achieve. What those negotiations are designed to achieve is the United Kingdom's exit from its current membership of the European Union. And I'm asking you whether you now accept, whether the Scottish Government now accepts that the United Kingdom is going to leave the European well, Union. Uh, with, with the greatest respect, I'm not trying to be difficult, Mr Tompkins, and I'm sorry you've taken this in that way. I'm not trying to be difficult at all, but when you have the chief negotiator on the EU side saying that, you know, other possibilities out of this is, are possible, it would be very foolish for me not to agree to him. There are lots of possibilities out of this. What I'm saying, and I don't think there's a great deal of difference between us, so let's not try and exaggerate it. What I'm saying is there's a set of negotiations underway whose purpose is, the purpose of those negotiations is to allow that exit to take place. It is important we participate in a way that helps to protect Scotland's interests. But I'm not 100% convinced that it, the exit will happen. I think the political instability at the present time indicates it's getting worse rather than better. I think many, many options remain there. But the purpose of the negotiations is to leave. Uh, our purpose of our involvement in those is to ensure that Scotland's interests are protected in that regard. And that's what we should be doing and are trying to do. Can I ask you about the phrase you used in your answer to the convener's question? You used the phrase constitutional due process. Do you accept that in the Miller judgment, the United Kingdom Supreme Court unanimously ruled that it is a feature of our constitutional law that the United Kingdom's membership 
of the European Union is a reserved matter for the United Kingdom government and not a devolved matter for the Scottish uh, government. I, I accept that, but I also believe that there is a wider issue of constitutional due process, which, for example, the European Parliament will be concerned with, which is the willingness to ensure that this is an exercise entered into by the United Kingdom in full consultation with all its parts. And that has not been the case. Consultation with? And I think consultation in the UK sense means participation uh -huh. and involvement. So you don't mean consultation, you mean well, participation? Well, uh, what I want to see is... is this is know, quite important, if you look this distinction. This distinction is quite Kalina, important. shall I answer? Or? I, I, I would, let's try and keep this in yeah. asking questions yeah, and answering I'm the questions. I'm very happy to be helpful, as helpful as I possibly can in, in answering questions, and let me do so. Um, I'm pretty sure some of the evidence that you've taken is very interesting in this regard, because if we get locked into that, that there is a line there, and, and that line is the only line that you can have, then we're not going to make any progress. It, the, I think the obsession with process has perhaps not allowed us to look at the way in which we could make some progress. Uh, we can make some progress if we understand that in the constitutional terms, the present UK government has done its best to exclude the devolved administrations and has not honoured the promises and the commitments that it made by entering into the, JMC, the new part of the JMC structure. That is germane and is understood by ourselves, by the Welsh, by many in Northern Ireland, and increasingly by members of the EU. It would be better to move on now, given the, the situation, and to find a way to make that work again. I would hope that the UK government is thinking of that, and we are constructively, as I say with the Welsh, putting forward ideas how that could happen. JMC, I know that Ash was interested in that area. I'm not sure if it's all been unpicked the way you want. I, mean, I think it has to an extent, but I think it's worth just, um, this is kind of the way I see it. So obviously I'm interested in the, what you see as the future being for the JMC process as it is at the moment. Um, and you have alluded to the fact that you don't think the terms of reference in this case are being met. Obviously in the UK, we've got a current set of intergovernmental relations, which I suppose, well, I would characterise it as being quite asymmetric in terms of the power balance. So if we've got the JMC system and potentially the two governments are looking for something quite different from that, so you could say that maybe the UK government is looking for maybe a sort of a light form of consultation and the UK government is probably looking for more meaningful engagement in that. Do you think this process really is up to the job, even taking into account some of the things you put in your letter, your joint letter to David Davis? Do you think it's up to the job, especially at a time such as this with Brexit? There's, there's been a lot of, of, of analysis of JMC process over <coughs> many years, and nobody who's examined it in any way, I mean, uh, the House of Commons Justice Committee, the House of Commons Welsh Affairs Committee, the House of Commons Scottish Affairs Committee, the Calman Commission, the Silk Commission, the Smith Commission, the Institute for Government, the House of Lords Constitution Committee, <coughs> just to name a few, have all examined JMC process and all have said it's not fit for purpose. So we've got something that doesn't really work and has never worked. Uh, nonetheless, it's all we've got at the present moment. We think it could be improved in the particular circumstances in which we find ourselves uh, because it's so important that there is a mechanism. Now, the terms of reference are really clear for the JMCEN, and it's not us that have breached them. You know, we, we've not had a willingness from the UK government to live up to this. Indeed, the Prime Minister has described the JMCEN in terms that don't appear in the terms of reference. You know, talked about us, uh, the devolved administrations, I think, having the opportunity to make representations to the UK government, which is not you know, what we're talking about. So we need to work out whether this can still operate effectively. If it can't, and it, I think the view of all those who have been involved is it's huge difficulties with it, how would we move to something else? And that's actually you know, a little like some of the issues we might come on to in a minute of frameworks. You, know, you can do so by negotiation and discussion, accepting that all parties are equal and we're going to find a way forward, or you can just tell people what you're going to do. We have a structure. This structure should be used to see if we can find a better structure. So in other words, the first task is to bring the JMCEN back together, to look at, for example, the proposals that Mark, and, Mark Drakeford and I have made, to look at other proposals that exist, and then to say, let's take this forward. Um, and that's what we should be doing. Uh, and you know, I am absolutely ready to take part in those discussions. Um, and so are the Welsh. There is the issue of the Northern Irish um, uh, situation. We will know. Tomorrow, I think at four o'clock is, is the deadline, whether there will be an administration set up in Northern Ireland. If there is one, then we move forward with that. 
Um, and then we, we talk about the weaknesses of it and how we can make it work. It is unbalanced. I mean, I, I think asymmetrical is a very generous way to look at it. You know, there's a very large UK presence and, and, and the rest of us sit around. The arrangements were shambolic in terms of, of meetings and agendas. There needs to be a recognition that we need to make progress in individual items. And now negotiations are underway. It needs to slot into the, 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 the four weekly negotiating cycle. Uh, and I think we can all see ways in which that could happen. You know, if you look at the negotiating cycle as described by uh, both sides now, uh, Barnier and, and Davis, there are the specific purposes for each of the weeks. We inject ourselves into the four-week negotiating cycle uh, at a point which of most relevance, and then we 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 we, we meet uh, every week. Um, there's the opening round was the 19th of June, 2nd, 17th of July, 4th, 28th of August, 5th, 18th of September. 6th, uh, 5th, 9th October. So we have those. We know what each week is meant to uh, produce. So we could fit into that slot. So you're saying you think that, I mean, this is the process we have, the JMCEN. You think it could be made to work with some kind of tweaks to the system, maybe being more efficient and meeting more often. But, well, do, but have you been given any indication of willingness on the side of the UK we, government to We've make, not been given any indication of anything. I, 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 both Mark and I received a letter on Friday from David Davis about the citizenship proposals, which wasn't any more than the Prime Minister had made public on Thursday night. Um, but a, the end of that, there was a, a line in the letter which uh, I think more or less said that they, they were still thinking about things. Um, and they need to come to the table and talk. We can't make progress in this unless we sit down to make progress in this. I mean, that's the basic, basic message. And uh, we need to get that message, meeting. This area, Neil, you were interested in all the transparency around this. Yeah, <clears throat> I think um, raised issues of transparency with me last time um, you were here. Um, the terms of reference for the Article 50 negotiations state that both the EU Commission and the UK Government, um, the, for, for them both, the default is transparency. Um, will the Scottish Government's default position in relation to its uh, intergovernmental discussions on Brexit be transparency? What documents will the Scottish Government publish in relation to any intergovernmental negotiations on the withdrawal agreement and the new relationship with the EU? Yeah, I mean, it will be. Uh, I think transparency is the right way to do this, and we will uh, publish our documentation, providing we're part of it, I should say, because we've got no guarantee we'll be part of it, but if we become part of it and this process moves on, we will do so. We've taken an open uh, approach to this in any case. The difficulty that arose uh, some months ago about the publication of uh, letters was part of the convention under FI. We don't release other people's letters; they release them. Uh, when, because we've got nothing that we don't want people to know is taking part here. Um, I'm keen that we publish our approach to each of the major issues as they arise uh, within the negotiating process, so that that is clear. And they will be, you know, in many cases, supportive of the UK's position, uh, where they are different from the UK's position, and that is a useful debate that we can have and a discussion. The process can only improve by transparency from all sides. So we'll we'll publish um, you know, what we have, and we'll be open about it. We already report, you know, on meetings of the JMC are reported on through a formal process in the Parliament. Um, I'm happy to look at that again if it's helpful to do so, and I am happy to discuss cross-party. I mean, I did, I did write to the, all the other parties two weeks ago, offering to sit down and talk about things. I'm awaiting a response. Uh, when I have that response, I'm very happy to sit down and talk on a cross-party basis uh, with individual spokespeople about where we are with this, and I think that would be helpful. I think, I think that's welcome, because there's obviously been concerns about um, with the Scottish Government in relation to freedom of information requests recently. I know that's not necessarily affected yourself, Minister, but there is you know, obviously concerns about, about transparency, um, and it shouldn't, it shouldn't take freedom of information requests to get this. I'm, uh, I'm not going to enter into that debate. Uh, you know, that's a debate for another place and another time. There are lots of issues within it. My pr approach to this is, I believe, entirely consistent with the approach being taken by the EU and by the European Parliament. And the United Kingdom government has committed itself uh, to the same process, quite rightly. And that will be helpful. A fair bit of time in this area, but there are a couple of areas, issues I want to tease out just before we finish this particular area of discussion. And there's a couple of letters. First of all, the... <coughs> Secretary of State's letter to you of the 29th of March, when, which referred to the interministerial official <coughs> level bilateral engagement when it talked about intensive discussions between officials on Scotland's place in Europe, including a substantive work programme and a good deal of resource being applied to that. 
Has there been any? Uh, I know Patrick wants to ask you about the joint letter, but has there, uh, uh, but has there been any r reality to that letter? Well, this is a very difficult, <coughs> contentious area. You know, there are no doubt that there have been lots and lots of meetings of officials. Uh, you know, uh, uh, my view of that, and the officials' view of that, has been that they've produced virtually nothing because there has been no information come back. And when we get on to talk to, about the Great Repeal Bill, as I hope we will, I, I think it's a useful illustration of this. Um, we have not seen anything that is contained in the Great Repeal Bill. The normal process for a major piece of legislation that has implications for the Scottish Parliament would be intensive engagement by officials in the construction of that legislation. So there's a full understanding of what's taking place, and particularly between lawyers. That simply has not been happening. These channels have essentially closed down. So, you know, I've heard David Davis talk about, you know, 100 meetings between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. There may have been, but the content of those meetings has not produced any results because nothing, no policy options, for example, have come back to us. And you can't actually make decisions unless you know what the policy options being considered are. So I, I think the answer is, I think it was a good try, but I don't think that that actually tells you the truth of what's taking place. Okay. I'm going to come to the great appeal stuff through Ivan in a minute, but I know Patrick wants to talk about the joint letter. Thank you. Just a, a couple of quick uh, follow-up points. Uh, Ash uh, mentioned the, the joint letter from yourself and Mr Drakeford from the, the Welsh administration. Um, one of the issues that you're seeking to put on the agenda uh, for the GMC is analysis of the economic impact of various scenarios, including no deal and of reverting to WTO rules, leaving the single market and withdrawing from the customs union. Um, can I take it from your earlier comments that you're also seeking to put on the agenda the economic analysis of the economic impact of remaining in the single market and of the other options that the Scottish and Welsh administrations are pursuing, including the transitional uh, arrangements that you that you discussed? Yes, and I mean, some of that material we published already in Scotland's place in Europe. Some of that material was published in the Welsh Government Securing Wales's Future uh, document, which came out a, a month later, which still remain the most substantive contributions to this debate. But yes, uh, I think we were also driven there by David Davis's admission that there had been no analysis of the no deal scenario, which we thought was very concerning. And, and so if the GMC EN gets up and running again, it's a requirement from your point of view that it conducts an analysis of the, <coughs> the options of staying inside the single market? Well, it, there is no doubt that that has to be a serious option and there's a cost adoption. And, and just finally, um, a couple of paragraphs later, uh, you say that uh, you, you make the suggestion of significantly reducing the number of attendees from the UK government. I just wonder if you could explain <coughs> that. I mean. I remember stacking the room as a tactic in student politics, but I, I'm slightly surprised if that's what's going on in the UK government. Um, I, I would, of course, not use those terms uh, to discuss it. Uh, it. It's important to realise that there isn't a sort of equity of arms at the uh, JMC and never has been. I, uh, I recall a, member of the J, uh, a meeting of the JMC Europe in, when I was last a member, I think in 2009, some stage, in which uh, there were 21 UK ministers present, myself and Rodri Morgan. You know, so it wasn't exactly a, a meeting between the devolved administration and the UK government. Now, JMC Europe it, it tends to be used because it's a meeting before European Council as a sort of briefing for a minister, so a lot of UK ministers turn up. JMC EN, however, has brought to the table not just DEXU, who have been running it, um, at the Department for Exiting the EU, but also the Foreign Office, Alan Duncan is used to attending. You can understand that with a responsibility, Foreign Office responsibility. Uh, sometimes uh, somebody from trade, uh, you know, from time to time. Chancellor has been, uh, the, and the Chief Secretary is usually there. Cabinet Office, um, uh, Ben Gummer was there, when, of course he's no longer there, but I would presume now the First Secretary will attend. The Territorial Secretaries of State, all three of them, um, come along, and then from time to time other ministers are added. Now, the, 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 from the devolved administrations, it would be myself, plus if a special subject was being discussed, you can bring an additional minister. Michael Masson came to discuss justice on one occasion. Uh, Mark Drakeford, and again, any supplementary he would have, but normally not, and normally not for me, and then two ministers from Northern Ireland, which at the start of the process were, the, were Martin McGuinness and Arlene Foster, as, because Martin particularly wanted to be there, and I think he was right at that level of representation. Uh, after Mar Martin's very sad demise, um, then it has been two ministers from the administration, but 
without the power to, to do anything other really than listen or make representation. They can't take anything away for action. We would envisage, Mark and I would certainly envisage, and we've discussed it a lot, a much more flexible uh, uh, arrangement in which there would be probably Dexu and one other representative, uh, the devolved administrations and additional ministers as required. We would hope that they, it would move around you know, the country a bit. We always meet in London. There's only once been a meeting of the JMC, of any part of the JMC, outside London. I think I'm right about that. And that was Cardiff at the end of January this year, where the JMC plenary was there. Um, and, you know, it is not inconceivable that we could, you know, have clearly ag agreed agendas in time, action points, and some dedicated resource to taking things forward. I think we've been on this a few time in this area, so I'm going to move on to the Great Repeal stuff. Ivan. Um, thanks, Convener, and thanks, Minister, for coming along uh, this morning. Um, yeah, I, you've already kind of touched on this to some extent, but I just want to explore and get a bit more, a bit more clarity around about the Great Repeal Bill and the other associated pieces of legislation from the, the Queen's speech. And it's around about the extent to which initially the UK government has kept the Scottish government informed. Um, and you've obviously given some indication on that and what have you seen there. And I suppose to compare and contrast that to what would normally be the process at this stage of a, a bill. Yeah, I mean, I have indicated pretty strongly where we are with, with this, but um, let me start by saying this. We've known about the Great Repeal Bill since it was announced at the Tory party conference, actually, last year. And we had a, the First Minister had a phone call from David Davis on, I think, the Saturday night before the start of the uh, uh, conference to say that he was going to announce this the day after, or well, the Prime Minister was going to announce this the day after. So we've known about its existence and the idea of it since last October. Um, when the JMC EN started to get underway in, in um, first meeting was October? November. November. First meeting was in November. Then clearly it featured and has continued to feature. Uh, at the start, there was a discussion about its drafting, so we say it would be in draft and it would be discussed later. We understood that there was, and we only understood because we haven't seen anything, we understood there was a draft bill round about the turn of the year into February because it was discussed uh, at the January and February JMC ENs, only the extent that we were asking to see it, and I, indeed I raised the timetable of it at the JMC plenary in Cardiff with, directly with the Prime Minister to make the point that we needed to see, and that we're talking then in, in late January actually, um, I made the point that we needed to see the bill and we needed to see the timetable for the bill so that we knew what was going to take place uh, because we had to prepare for it. There had been a trawling exercise right across the UK from the various governments about issues that might require to be included and, uh, uh, and problems that might occur. But we couldn't really analyse what the issue would be in Scotland until we knew the solutions that they were planning to change particularly subordinate legislation. Now, we haven't seen anything. The normal procedure in a bill uh, of, that has con uh, consequences in terms of uh, the devolved uh, uh, competencies would be that civil servants would be involved at a very early stage discussing the issues that should arise, the way in which it should be handled, the normal intergovernmental stuff. And you know, if there is a glue of intergovernmental activity, it is through the work of civil servants with each other on an informal basis and occasionally through the official part of the JMC. But there's an informal liaison that takes place. Um, nothing has been revealed to us. No, in, no drafting has been shown to us. Even the lawyers' channels have not worked. And, and usually the lawyers' channels are active no matter what is happening. Um, lawyers have a, you know, a, a camaraderie in this which, uh, which helps. Nothing's happened there. So we don't know what the policy solutions to be applied are. I had a conversation with David Davis about this in February, uh, in which he talked for the first time about bringing uh, case law into the bill, just as a theoretical issue, and that was that. So we, we understand the bill will be now published within the next fortnight. Well, sorry, <laughs> Gerald is shrugging. Yeah, let the record show that Gerald is shrugging at this. I, shortly. We, we believe it will be published shortly. Uh, we do have an arrangement now for our officials to discuss the bill uh, with the UK uh, on Friday. Right? I, I don't think there's any problem in saying that. That's a piece of transparency. There will be a discussion on Friday for the first time in which we understand that some details of the bill will be vouchsafed to them in London uh, on a confidential basis. 
That will be the first opportunity we have if it happens, you know, and I'm not holding my breath, but if it happens, then we will have some understanding of what may be in the bill. Now, that's just that bill. There are a number of other bills announced. Uh, the farming bill, we've endeavoured to find out what's in it. We understand they don't know. The UK government doesn't know what's going to be in the farming bill. Um, and, of course, then there is the very vexed question of um, subordinate legislation, you know, which flows from this. Um, I've had one conversation with David Davis about uh, legislative support, no, two, actually, legislative consent, and I'm very pleased that he indicated in the House of Commons on uh, Monday, I think, yes, that there would be a legislative consent motion. The Secretary of State for Scotland had indicated that there would be, uh, but he confirmed that on Monday. Uh, but we don't know to which parts the legislative consent motion will apply because we don't know what's in the bill. So we are presently flying blind. No, actually, we haven't yet taken off. But uh, we hope on Friday to be a little bit wiser. Do you, it may not, you may not be able to answer this, but do you perceive that this is because uh, the, the UK government doesn't know what's in the, these bills, or is it because they made a conscious decision to behave differently with respect to these bills as uh, they might normally? I think on many things, you know, to be fair, they ha don't really haven't really known themselves. On this one, the, the bill has been, to some extent or other, in draft form for a very considerable period of time. Now, you know, the draft may be sketchy. You know, there lots obviously lots of things will have changed, but I think it would have been possible to share it with us before. Now, the election, of course, intervened, you know, and, and those, that sort of does close things down, although s officials' channels normally stay open during the election period, so there can be conversation, but that didn't happen. So uh, I think it's been there. Um, ben Gummer and I had a conversation about it, I don't know, January perhaps, January or February, a very brief conversation. Uh, and he, which he said he would like to come up to Edinburgh and sit down with me and talk the bill through. That never happened. And in terms of, uh, I mean, what concerns have you got with respect to the timetable going forward, the amount of parliamentary time these bills are going to take up? Are we starting to run out of time here? Or, or well, I mean, let, let's be blunt that? here. We've got to do it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, you know I'm, I'm, on a very pragmatic approach to this, you know, we will have to have uh, you know, arrangements in place for the 29th of March 2019, so that there is not, you know, the cliff edge does not, you know, crumble underneath us and we fall. So we've got a big job to do to put this in place. You know, now, you know, I notice that uh, Mr. Fraser and uh, Mr. Tompkins are nodding vigorously to each other. This appears to be me uh, saying that this will take place. I am planning for all the eventualities, but what I'm trying to do is to make sure that Scotland is not put in an impossible position. So we will have to undertake this legislative task. And presently, I'm unaware of uh, exactly what that task will need. OK, thank you. Murdo is also interested in this area. Murdo. Thank you. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, just, just to clarify the position with the, the Great Repeal Bill, so, so you, you haven't seen it. Have you had any briefing from the UK government on the contents of the Great Repeal Bill? No. Nothing, nothing at all? Okay. No. We understand the Great Repeal Bill will require a legislative consent motion to be passed by the Scottish Parliament. What's the Scottish Government's current position on that? Well, we would have to see the legislative consent motion. I mean, I haven't seen it because I haven't seen the bill. So I, I couldn't commit to uh, you know, a position on the bill or a legislative consent motion without seeing it. I've indicated to you, as I've indicated to UK Government Ministers, that I recognise the reality of ensuring that there is the legislative framework is in place at the end of March 2019 so that Scotland does not have a whole set of even more intractable and difficult problems to resolve. Yeah. Uh, so that's where I am. But, you know, I, without seeing the bill, it would be impossible to say. Uh, we will certainly want to ensure the position is in place, but we're not going to be the midwife for a reduction in the powers of the Parliament, and that's quite clear. But you would accept that the, the consequence of the Scottish Parliament not passing a legislative consent motion would be that, well, legally, uh, the, the Supreme Court judgment in the, the Miller case determined that that would not prevent the UK government legislating if it wanted to. However, if, if it chose not to do that, the consequence would simply be to create a lacuna in Scots law. Uh, yes, I, I do accept that. I accept that the commitment that was entered into by the uh, UK Conservative government to make the Sewell Convention legally binding was not honoured. 
uh, in those circumstances, uh, you know, I accept the Supreme Court judgment, uh, but I also accept that the UK Parliament and the present UK government can simply ignore the position of the Scottish Parliament. That doesn't mean to say that you know, we are going to willingly accept changes to devolution that are undesirable. That is also, as I understand it, the very clear position of the Welsh Government. Okay, thank you. Um, we got into secondary legislations areas, Minister, and Liam wanted to pick up some of these issues. Thank you, Convener. Uh, yes, just on the secondary legislation, the briefing notes to the Queen's speech uh, talk about the repeal bill creating and containing temporary powers uh, to make secondary legislation to correct any legislation that doesn't operate appropriately after leaving the EU. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any information on how temporary is temporary, if I can put it that way? No. Right. Uh, anything at all on that? or No, we, we have no information at all. Uh, we've seen speculation on the nature of those powers. Um, we have seen speculation that those powers uh, will be, uh, and indeed we would expect if those powers exist, they would also be granted to Scottish ministers in specified circumstances. What those specified circumstances are, we do not know. So I, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know. Uh, staying on secondary legislation, uh, it would appear that much of the work to be done will involve secondary legislation. Uh, and this committee's looked at, you mentioned the Sewell Convention uh, earlier on. Does the Scottish Government have a view on whether the Sewell Convention applies to secondary legislation? Well, that is a very interesting point, um, and, and a point that we will need to debate uh, you know, at some length. I, I'm aware of the evidence that you have taken on this, and I think the straight answer will have to be that the Sewell Convention does not appear to apply to secondary legislation. It was a matter that was raised in the Smith Commission by the Scottish Government. Um, however, there are exceptions to that. If you look at the Public Bodies Act of 2011, that creates circumstances in which the Scottish Parliament uh, has a procedure uh, for dealing with a secondary legislation from the UK that has implications for Scotland. And uh, I think I would want to reserve our position on what would be possible there. The best way to approach this is to have mutual respect and to say that you know, there would be no attempt to make changes without consultation with the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and that would be the best way to take it forward. What the legal position is, given that the Sewell Convention is not justiciable, is quite clear that there wouldn't be a legal recourse. But it would be best to show mutual respect. And of course, that's the purpose of the Sewell Convention too, which is to show respect between the two institutions. And, and that would be, I would hope, how we would proceed. Uh, so finally, just staying on the secondary legislation, I, presumably you would accept that the, given the scale of Brexit, I, that some of the secondary legislation regarding devolved matters may have to be made by the UK government uh, rather than Scottish ministers. Uh, and if so, what is the appropriate level of involvement of the Scottish Government in the making of the secondary I, legislation? I wouldn't necessarily accept the first point only because we don't know, uh, simply because we don't know. It could be that somewhere in the legislation that the UK Government is planning is some clever fix which uh, you know, allows things to be done very quickly and in sort of in batches rather than individual. We had originally thought of this legislation as being targeted towards each circumstance. Uh, if this legislation is, as many speculate now, much broader, with an additional bill that has a, a means of dealing with things more broadly and then narrows down elsewhere, then it may well be that, that there is a way to do things which we can apply as well and therefore there's no need for uh, the UK to do it. If the UK is to do it, then I just make the point that there needs to be mutual respect. For example, uh, you know, an acceptance by us on a case-by-case -case basis, um, a, a resolution of the Scottish Parliament, which is your, a resolution of both houses of the par Parliament, would seem suitable. This will be about agreeing the way in which we can work together. And that sort of winds us back to the very start of this, which is this is a you know, incredibly messy and difficult set of circumstances. We need to find that way and we need to put that in place so that we can make some progress on it. And we won't find that way if we aren't sitting down and talking about it. Thank you. Can I just unpick that a little bit more, Minister? Because we had some very interesting evidence last week from um, Alan Page in this area. And yes, the, there will be an LCM associated with the Great Repeal Bill. There will be something between 800 and 1,000 pieces of legislation, secondary legislation, um, going through Westminster and here. Much of that 
um, legislation at Westminster in, in the secondary sense will be technical it'll be, and it'll be meaningless as far as the devolved settlement is concerned. But some of it may impinge significantly on devolved areas. And that process currently doesn't exist through Sewell. Uh, and you begin to explore other potential areas. But one of the areas that Professor Page suggested to us would would be an interesting area to look at would be to using the exercise of subordinate lawmaking powers in the devolved area subject to parliamentary procedures in both the UK and Scottish Parliament models, which are found in Schedule 7 yep. of the Scotland Act. Um, is that something the Scottish Government are looking at? Is it something you've had a discussion with the UK Government about? And if, you're, if you haven't, are you going to? Well, we haven't because the UK Government has not discussed this with us and not discussed the bill with us. But yes, I mean, I, I've looked at Schedule 7, and I mean, quite clearly, this would rely on, as I've just indicated to, to Mr. Kerr, resolutions from both houses. Um, and that, you know, that is a distinct possibility. But I would stress, I think the issue here is if we are going to find a way of working together, uh, then we can probably make this work pretty well. But if there was an intention that there would be simply be imposed, then it will become a difficulty. So approach to this is as important as, as the legality of it. But we will consider, I mean, I've I, I, I seen Professor Page's comments. Uh, we've got to remember that the Scottish Parliament does report to the Parliament every six months on transpositions. So you know, we're not, this is not an area that's completely unknown uh, and things do happen, but they happen with the consent of the Scottish Parliament. Uh, and that's you know, where we should stand back and look at this from. Westminster, I hope, would not wish to legislate in ways that did not have the consent of the Scottish Parliament. If that was understood, then this becomes, you know, we can deal with this. You mentioned yourself, Minister, in one of your previous answers about the importance of frameworks, and I know that's what Marie was interested in. Thank you, Convener. Um, having heard about the asymmetric nature of the intergovernmental relationship and also the shambolic nature of that relationship, um, just how concerned are you that instead of seeking agreement, the UK government will just impose UK-wide frameworks in areas which are currently devolved, such as agriculture, fishing and the environment? Yeah, we are concerned, very concerned. And, you know, this is a concern that's shared by the other, you know, certainly by the Welsh and, and shared certainly in part in Northern Ireland, I know. Um, there seems to be, you know, the language in this is, is quite interesting. I think we need to unpick it. There seems to be two sets of assumptions in this. One is that there are a set of frameworks in, in, in Brussels that deal with these matters which can be transposed by putting that decision-making into, into Westminster and then discussing what happens next. These decision-making processes in Brussels are essentially co-decision-making processes by independent members. You know, and what the Welsh have said is, you know, if that is the proposal to, to, to create essentially the equivalent of a ministerial council but co-decision-making, then they are prepared to discuss this as long as the, the, it starts with the devolution of all matters, say agricultural, back to the devolved administrations, and then we can talk about how these are exercised. And I've taken the same position. You know, uh, absolutely, if, if there's then to be a discussion on the basis of what the, the process is completed, of the promises during the referendum campaign of all these matters being devolved back, then that's a feasible thing to do. What is not feasible is to, to, to make the decision uh, ex cathedra by the UK government that all these matters will come back to Westminster and then an unspecified moment in the future in a process that is not agreed, and even the process we have in the JMCN isn't operating to find a way to ne negotiate and discuss these. That's not acceptable. Uh, and we'll go forward on that basis. There are sort of hints that decisions have already been made. I noticed that Charlie Jeffrey in his paper, which was a very good paper, I have to say, and I think very helpful in analysing the, 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 the two views that exist, um, <coughs> pointed out that in the Tory manifesto is a reference to UK agricultural um, policy. Uh, now, you know, the, the, this is concerning. Um, and, of course, has been the, the language of the so-called so UK single market has also been used, where in actual fact that shows a very uh, uh, actually erroneous understanding of what actually exists on the ground and, and how it operates in terms of devolution. So we've got some way to go to resolve this, but I do hope there will be a willingness to uh, uh, resolve it. 
The wrong way to do this would be to shove these things into pieces of Brexit legislation and say, you know, like it or lump it, and, uh, you know, we'll talk about it later. Uh, we, we would not accept that. OK. Um, do you have any proposals for how these issues could be resolved? Would there be, you know, so, so some of the people giving us evidence spoke about how these things are arranged in other European countries, and I think Belgium was held up as a particularly good example where the regional... Um, and the government, the intergovernmental relationships between the region and the central government were were very effective. Do you have proposals for how that should work going well, forward? Yes, we start with the JMCEN that's actually working, and then we look at a set of proposals for taking these issues back to the devolved administrations, and then we sit down and accept a power sharing arrangement. Uh, where that is appropriate and necessary, uh, and where it's not appropriate and necessary, we say, well, we'll be operating our, our distinctive policy, you know, which is the basis of devolution. Uh, I mean, let's look at, for example, you know, issues such as uh, um, single unit pricing for alcohol. You know, that's, the Scottish Government has taken that forward because it was a specific set of, uh, specific proposal for specific circumstances. You know, the logic of the UK position on the uh, so-called single UK market, which is, you know, an internal market, it's not a single UK single market, in those circumstances that wouldn't have happened, couldn't have happened, because it would have been seen as a barrier to, to trade. So I think we need to be very careful. There, you know, Charlie Jeffrey does identify quite correctly, you know, a divergence of view about where we are and where we want to go. Uh, and it's important that we discuss that through a structure that allows us to resolve it. Uh, and the JMCEN, I go back to it, is on this issue where we should be talking about this. Yeah. Just, for, <coughs> just for clarity, are there, are there any circumstances in relation to agriculture and, and fishing where the Scottish Government believe <coughs> that a UK common framework would be beneficial to the industries? Well, there could be. So, well, an example is animal health, which already is operated you know, as it operates on a collaborative basis because it needs to be so. If I remember correctly, and I need to go and look at this, but from my time as an environment minister, there was a single budget for animal health in the UK at the start of devolution, which was eventually devolved. So in actual fact, the nations took responsibility for those parts that weren't done in Europe, but they agreed to work very closely together. And of course, they worked also through the European veterinary framework, so that there was a European element to this, which helped and enhanced uh, the, the element in these islands. Now, we are absolutely ready to sit down and talk about these issues because they're new issues. You know, this, this is because of the Brexit process. What we're not willing to do is to, to accept as given that the default position is that everything reverts to Westminster and nothing reverts to, to the devolved administrations unless Westminster says so. And that's where we've got from the start of this process in which the campaign promises from the Leave campaign where all these matters would go to the devolved administrations. So again, this is an area which needs sensitive handling, but it starts by accepting the principle of devolution, and then we sit and talk about how these things could work. The Welsh uh, government published a paper two weeks ago on their views on this matter, and it was very helpful. And, you know, I didn't agree with all of it, but I think it's been a helpful contribution to this, and, and we also will bring forward some ideas of our own. But we want to sit down and talk about it. It's impossible to, to make progress on this unless we, we talk about it. You mentioned the, the Welsh situation and, and the paper they, they brought forward. In that paper, they also suggested, one of the suggestions they made was a, a voting procedure through a UK Council of Ministers framework. Um, <laughs> What did you think of that? Well, I mean, it's an idea. You know, I mean, I, I think when you get to, we have to start with the principles that are applying here and then move forward. There will be many ideas about how you would resolve those things. You know, there are ideas of, you know, Europe has, has been bedeviled by issues such as qualified majority voting and all those sort of things. So I think it's too early to talk about those. It's a, it's a welcome contribution on the table. You know, it shows a lot of thought being put into it. It shows the real concern in Wales about this. I mean, if you read that paper, it's a very strong introduction from the Welsh First Minister, Carmen Jones about the reality of the constitutional structure that we have now and the fact of how different it is from the 1970s, and he is not prepared to allow that to be rolled back. Whereas, you know, his fear, and the great fear of the Welsh, and I echo that, is that if these frameworks are operating in the way that presently appear to be proposed, they will roll things back. James, I know, James, I think you were interested in areas to do with legislative impact. I'm not sure if it's been covered or not. It's but been covered, It's yeah. been covered. Has anybody else got any remaining questions? 
No, no further remaining questions. Minister, thank you very much for coming along this morning. We've covered a lot of ground and a lot of detail, and we're very grateful to you. Um, at the start of the meeting, we agreed to take the next item in private and now close the public part of the meeting.